the uh, the, um, the the thing about I mean, and what Powell said, he didn't say that we're. I mean, their target is core PCE, you know, uh, personal consumption expenditure price index, core meaning excluding food and energy. And everyone's like, why would you exclude food and energy? Again, I'm not here to debate it. That's what they do. So yeah. if you want to think like a pet, pet head, that's what they do. Okay. They want to get core PCE year over year to 2%. It just came in at 5.2, which was up from August. So September was 5.2. August was about 4.7, give or take. <coughs> Pardon me. It just went up. I mean, it's not going down. So, um, so, but they're trying to get it down. Now, he, now Powell did not say, we're going to raise rates until core PC is 2%. He didn't say that. What he said was, we're going to raise rates until it's acting in a restrictive way on inflation, and inflation will come down on its own because rates will be higher and high enough to cause that mm -hmm. at which point we will we the fed will pause and and you say well when are you going to cut rates he was like the, the pause could be a year right so so there, you're talking tw forget this fed pivot nonsense i mean you're talking 2024 if then before they cut rates but in the meantime um so they've got to get rates high enough so they're going to go you know well, well 75 basis points in november december who knows we'll we'll know closer to the date it'll either be 50 or 75 you know some talk about 50 but it doesn't matter i mean it, it it's going up probably going to go up you know i have the calendar for 2023 there's a meeting february 1st and another one in uh, late march i think march 22nd they'll probably raise up both of those they're going to get rates up to five five ish um at that point they probably will have achieved the goal of bringing core PCE down, but they will also have destroyed the economy in the process. It's like I remember in, in Vietnam, the old saying, you know, we had to we had to destroy the village to save it. Yeah. Um, we have to destroy the economy to save it. This this is uh, the latest and long string of uh, Fed blunder since uh, 1913 seems to be their specialty, but that's what they're doing. Yeah, and you know what, uh, and I do want to get to your book here in a minute, um, but uh, right now, is there really much different the Fed could be doing? Yeah, they they could uh, they could uh, at least pause now, or maybe even cut rates. If 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 everything I said is correct, and obviously I think it is, or I wouldn't be saying it, but if we're on the verge of a global liquidity crisis, as revealed by the euro dollar futures curve and the treasury yield curve, and you know, uh, negative swap spreads and uh, treasury bill auctions with the yield of maturity below what the Fed will give you for a phone call. I mean, all those things are happening. That's hard data. Uh, and it's a very, very uh, um, uh, troubling sign, less seen in 2008, by the way, before the two, before the Lehman Brothers meltdown. If all that's happening and the fundamental signs are also weak, which we just saw in third quarter GDP, which is based on net exports, which won't last. How, how are you going to drive a trade surplus with, with the strongest dollar in 20 years? Good luck with that. I mean, nobody can afford our stuff and we're not buying anybody else's stuff. Right. Um, so with the economy going into a recession on its own, with a global liquidity crisis brewing, why on earth is the Fed raising rates at all? Okay. And so does that imply then if we just sort of let the system take care of itself that cpi would get pulled down anyways sure, by yeah. this recession right and that's that's a big part of my book um you know when i when i talked to my editor about this you know go back a year ago so in november <clears throat> pardon me november uh, 2021 you know, every headline you looked at website commentary supply chain supply chain supply chain is breaking down there's no uh you know uh, uh they, they couldn't get cream cheese to make uh make cheesecakes uh, at Junior's, you know, the world's world's most famous cheesecake place, um, you know, and on and on and on, like a, a long list. And then last spring was the, the baby formula shortage, which is actually was serious. I mean, mothers couldn't feed their children. So it was very bad. And I talked to my editor about the book. We said, okay, let's do it. Um, and of course, and so I've got three chapters uh, to start one on, uh, you know, just anecdotal stuff, kind of thing I just mentioned, how bad is it? Chapter two is why, what, what caused it? When did it start? And right, how we get I, here. Yeah. I found some, but I found some really, really interesting research that, uh, cause everyone says, well, yeah, COVID messed it up and the war in Ukraine messed it up. Well, that's true, but it didn't start there. This started in 2018 with Trump's tariffs because when, and I, I'm not here to debate the tariffs. I actually think the tariffs were a good idea, but that was the start of the supply chain breakdown because when Trump put tariffs on, started with, uh, appliances you know washing machines refrigerators and stuff and then solar panels and then you know technology and then they just kept piling on 
Okay. Well, and Chinese, sorry to interrupt, but, but, but did that mostly impact goods from China, those tariffs? Yes. Um, but, but you have to look at what China did in response. China, the U.S. and Brazil are the two largest exporters to soybeans. China is the world's largest importer of soybeans. Mm -hmm. China was buying all their soybeans from the United States just as a way to kind of make it make it up a little bit. Like, well, we don't want we got to buy the soybeans anyway. Why not buy them from the U.S. to keep the U.S. China trade deficit under control so it doesn't become too politically toxic? Um, well, as soon as we Trump threw on the tariffs, China retaliated by moving their soybean uh, orders to Brazil. Stop buying U.S. soybeans. Well, that's not a phone call. I mean, you're talking about vessels, port facilities, uh, agriculture, you know, trucks. How do you get the soybeans to the ports? Uh, how many do you grow? Where's the fertilizer coming from? You know, et cetera, et cetera. And all those parties, you know, the shippers, the cargo, the insurance companies, and so many people involved, banks, letters of credit, it's just a lot involved. Um, they don't like short-term relationships. They say, okay, I'll do it. I want a five-year contract. And China said, okay. So they reconfigured all those transportation lanes to get the soybeans from Brazil. All of a sudden, you're a U.S. soybean grower. You say, well, what do I do? Well, we start selling them to the Netherlands because the Netherlands needs soybeans too. So now, but now instead of shipping them from like Port of L.A. to Ningbo and near Shanghai, we're shipping them from Port of Houston to, I don't know, uh, France or Marseille or someplace uh, or, or Rotterdam. So the point being, um, you completely scrambled all these uh, supply chain relationship and they break down that it's not, it's not that it's the end of the supply chain. I actually start the book. I have an introduction uh, where I talk about a bronze age vessel, a wreck in a place called Ulu Barun, which is off the Southern coast of Turkey that was discovered by a sponge diver in the 1980s. And then it was, it was excavated. It was the most perfectly preserved bronze age cargo they've ever discovered, but what was in it. And I have the inventory list and a lot of research on it. There was uh, amber from uh, the vicinity of the Baltic Sea. There was gold, which came, at the time came from Sudan. There were swords, which at the time came from you know Damascus or, or you know present day uh, Israel and Lebanon. Um, you know there was oil from uh, from uh, olive oil from from Italy, etc. There was a carving for of uh, Queen Nefertiti, which was bound for her in Alexandria, Egypt. The point being, uh, this vessel had a was doing a, a counterclockwise um, a circuit of the Mediterranean Sea, you know, based on the winds, picking up and dropping off cargo all along the way. But that supply chain, if you go from, you know, like Sw Sweden to Sudan, it's almost the Arctic Circle to the equator, and from present day Iran to Spain, that's 5 million square miles. So there's nothing new about supply chains. We can document to the Bronze Age. What was new beginning around 1989 was supply chain science. The combination of vastly improved computing power, artificial intelligence, new algorithms, and more sources of data that could be put together and used by experts to, to optimize and make the supply chains more efficient. That was new. And it kind of began with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union. And you know, Berlin Wall fell in 1989, Soviet Union uh, dissolved uh, in 1991. 